Hi, I'm Grace Park. I started off my career as a United States Army officer after graduating from the United States Military Academy at West Point. I have no family background or any relatives who were in the service prior. And other than just my parents who had lived through the Korean War as children, and they hailed the United States general officers as heroes, and they were graduates of West Point. So I was quite intrigued and inspired, and that's what led me to apply there and, and attend and graduate from West Point. And after uh, serving for five years as a army officer, I left as a captain, and then uh, came into the private sector in pharmaceuticals where the CEO of Bristol Myers Squibb hired me into mid-level management and marketing function. And uh, coincidentally, he was a former naval officer. So he made sense or understood how to translate the last five years of the military into, into corporate. And so after uh, pharmaceuticals, I actually uh, came into medical devices. It was considered the new sunrise sector within healthcare. And I had p &L responsibility, which was very exciting and increased the responsibility over the years. And uh, after five years, I was the managing director of Medtronic for 10 countries here in Asia. So uh, I've been in Singapore, lived here as home base, but worked throughout Asia for the last 16 years. And I landed here on a Fulbright Fellowship after graduating from, the, from Harvard Business School and Kennedy School of Government. It's a joint master's program. And so what I do today, what I do now, or what I've been doing for the last several years is actually um, co-founded my company called Doc Doc. It, the purpose behind this company actually stems from a, a personal experience in which my daughter was born healthy, but at her third month checkup, the doctor had said her liver was failing and that we need to admit her into the hospital. Uh, she needed a liver transplant. And so our world had turned completely upside down. And when we asked the head surgeon, how many times have you done a liver transplant? How much is it gonna cost? And how are your other patients doing? Are they thriving? Uh, the response was, I'm the head of department. I'm good at my job. And so we knew then and there that we needed to embark on a global search. And we found one of the pioneers of live liver transplants who had done thousands and thousands of these surgeries, whereas that initial team had done only a handful. And our doctor, despite his expertise, was 60% less in cost. And we actually had days and not minutes to make our decision. But that's the current state of healthcare. Patients are in the dark when they have to navigate through the healthcare system. And so when my husband, who is also the CEO and co-founder of DocDoc, Doc, was recovering the ICU after donating a piece of his liver to our daughter, it became clear to us what Doc Doc needed to be to empower patients to make data-driven decisions in their doctor discovery process. Rather than sharing with you a trend in healthcare in which it's already top of mind or uh, it's obvious, I wanted to share with you a trend in which not too many people are talking about, surprisingly, and it impacts us all and that is the cost of healthcare. It is going up year on year. Medical inflation is out of control globally. It is two to three times greater than general inflation rates. And if we just did nothing and kept going as per usual, it's going to bankrupt countries, bankrupt companies, and bankrupt families. But what's going on in healthcare? What you'll find actually is that price and quality has no relationship. There's no correlation in healthcare. So market forces are not at work, unlike in other sectors. Because there is a lack of data in healthcare, patients are not able to make discerning decisions. So if you take, for example, compare it to the auto industry, when you go buy a car, you have intermediate markers, so then the consumer can be more intelligent and make better decisions. So you have information like crash testing, um, uh, miles per gallon, uh, 
you know, resale value. These are just some of the markers, metrics, in which a consumer can decide and at the right price point for him or her can make their decision. But if you compare that to healthcare, what are patients doing? One, they depend on doctor directories. Insurance companies have plenty of these, but let's say a patient needs to go have a heart surgery. How can one wisely discern between doctor number 17 and doctor number 37 on that list simply based on a name, photo, and address? It has no bearing to the actual outcome of that surgery and how you can have more confidence that you chose the right doctor, right? Or patients may ask their family doctor, but typically these relationships between doctors are uh, based on social or commercial uh, linkages in nature and not necessarily having the patient uh, in the middle. Or third, patients may just ask friends and family, do you have any advice where to go, who to see? But these are anecdotal at best and at a very limited sample size. And so what ends up happening is through the lack of data, patients are making up their own metrics and figuring out, oh, if a doctor is expensive, then that doctor must be very good. Or if a doctor has gray hair, he must be very senior. Or if the hospital floor is made of marble, then it must be a very fancy and a luxurious ho hospital, not a hotel, <laughs> but a place in which it will be sterile and clean for my surgery. So in the absence of data, people make stuff up and this is not right. And what ends up happening is that it leads to um, higher readmission rates, greater anxiety, and higher medical costs at the end of the day. And what's important is that we empower patients to make more informed decisions throughout their healthcare journey. I'm fortunate that my leadership principles and values were largely established while a cadet at West Point. And so it served me quite well all throughout my career, regardless of whichever sector I was in or whatever job I had to do. But if I were to highlight a few, I would say number one, character matters. Do the right thing even when no one's looking. Secondly is that um, be dependable uh, as a team player. So show up on time. If you've committed to turning in a project within a certain date, then follow through with that commitment. Uh, what this means is that uh, we have to learn how to prioritize and to project manage our time well. And I think that these are very important skill sets. The third point I mentioned is to lead by example. What I mean by that is don't ask anybody to do something in which you wouldn't do yourself. So other than these three points, I would also share uh, other learnings that I had throughout my career uh, number one is learn how to build critical thinking skills to solve problems. So, uh, you know, have a beginner's mindset. Think in terms of first principles. Because just because a solution is in existence today doesn't mean that it's the best for society. Challenge the status quo. The other point I'd mention is sales. I know it sounds very simple, but whether in your personal life or your professional life, effective communication matters. Even in healthcare, in my sector, it's highly fragmented. There's so many silos with all of these stakeholders that to be able to understand the other side's perspective, to be able to effectively negotiate and persuade and influence others is very important because these relationships actually do matter a lot. The third point I would mention is learn how to lead a team. The transition you make as an individual contributor to a team leader is going to be one of the biggest jumps that you make. And in this day and age, nothing gets done um, by yourself. You need a team behind you. So the ability to motivate and inspire and to influence others to uh, join you in your mission to hit a certain goal um, is going to be very critical. And I think these are important skill sets to have. And so my first point I like to share is to strive to be the best version of yourself every day. My second point I like to share is that 
anything worth doing will attract the critics. So uh, as an entrepreneur, I think of myself as going into the boxing ring and there will be spectators all around um, criticizing and making comments. Uh, one of my favorite um, speeches was made by Theodore Roosevelt who, who um, said the famous speech, uh, Man in the Arena. And that's very much what we are. And I always thought that there would be an end to the journey or a finish line uh, for every achievement, but I, that's, a, that's a myth. There is no finish line or the finish line actually is death. So the important thing is to embrace the journey, both the highs and lows and expect it, right? And so, um, because there is no, there is no finish line. There is no, life doesn't get easier after you achieve this certain milestone, you know? And so it, it very much is to be able to embrace the journey. The third point um, I'd share is that if you haven't done so already, is I encourage you to write out your own personal mission statement. If big successful companies uh, have their own mission statements, then why not have one for your own? I created mine in my 20s and regardless of whatever jobs or industries that I had gone into, my personal mission statement, which is to be a leader of character and make a significant positive impact in society, has been my guidepost all throughout my life. So hopefully these three um, life tips can be helpful.